Amen. Thank the Lord for the good time of fellowship. We're going to ask our men to come now take the Lord's offering up this morning. For those of you that may be online, we had a difficulty getting online today. And I don't know, we've had some struggles. My wife and I at our house, we had problems with our internet uh, over the weekend. On, uh, I guess it was uh, Friday night, I think it was. We'd come in and everything was out. Every, our phones were out, the internet was out, the whole thing. But uh, they finally got that back up and running. So I don't know if we're having a problem in the area again today. But uh, we apologize uh, for not getting on, online as quickly as possible. But thank you for tuning in if you've tuned in today. Thank you, church, for your giving to the house of the Lord and the work of the Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. The Lord's certainly been good to us. And I thank the Lord for that. We were able to go back out and, and uh, try to visit some folks yesterday. And thank God for the good visits we had. And thank God for the outreaches we have in the church. He's been good to us, and I thank the Lord for being so faithful to us and being so good to us. We owe him our everything. You give to the Lord this morning, and yet you give with confidence that God will guide us and direct us in how to use his money. Thank you for your, for your faithfulness to the work of the Lord. I'm ask Brother Travis, if you would, Brother, if you'd pray with the offering this morning, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day. Yes. And Lord, I thank you once again for bringing us back. Thank you, God. Help us, Lord, today, please. And Lord, we pray once again for the people, Lord, that are lost again. Lord, to your soon coming. Yes. And Lord, I pray for this offering. And I pray that you'll continue to be with us, Lord. Through yes. Through the week. And we just love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your giving. Let me mention this to you now. If you saw Sister Merck slip out, uh, they sent me word that she's having a problem with, with her eye. She's got a problem seeing out of one eye anyhow, and then she had cataract surgery, and then uh, one of the eyes is causing a problem that she can see with it sometimes and can drive, but when it starts getting real blurry, she has to go take those drops. Just go home and get those drops in it because she can't see to drive, so that's where she went. She had to go home and get the drops in her eye and... Uh, and uh, try to take care of that. You pray for it. Lord, keep her safe going home and be able to drive okay. But uh, the Lord might be with her and help her there. Um, let me make our announcements now. Next Saturday now is our, I don't, we, we don't really have a, a, a title for this day. It's the ladies' gingerbread uh, contest thing. They're going to be making their gingerbread and just fellowship and that. And then the men going to have a chili cook-off. That's next Saturday. Uh, I got to talk with Brother Charlie and, and Miss Norma uh, yesterday. Miss Norma, is it Norma Jean? What's her for? Norma Jean. I always call her Miss Norma, but, uh, and they may come. I don't know if they will get to, coop, get to come or not, but uh, uh, they, they said they'd consider it. So I, I asked uh, Miss Norma if she wanted to come, told her to not worry about the gingerbread house, that, that we, we'd have a couple of extras probably, and, and she's welcome to come and participate in that. And I hope that she does. I really do. So you pray the Lord willing that, uh, that they make it a blessing. But that's this coming Saturday now at 3.30, ladies. If you can be here at the church at 3.30, they'll be having refreshments and, and a good time of fellowship. And then at 5.30, the men will be here. If you want to come early and go ahead and make your chili here in the kitchen, that's not a problem. You can do that or you can make it home and bring it. We've got the sign-up list in the back. Uh, both for the uh, gingerbread, if there's somebody still would like to participate in that. We haven't picked up the kits yet, so if you'd like to participate in that, put your name on the list. It's $10 for each, approximately $10 for each one of these kits. I, I think it was, uh, right, it was right at $10 last year. I can't remember if it went a little over or a little under, but right at that last year, and I'm sure it's about the same thing this year, and we'll get those this week. But if you want to be part of that, ladies, please get your name on the list. 
because we don't buy a whole lot of extras, just one or two, just in case we have a situation where Miss Norma might get to come or something like that. Uh, but if, if you'd like to participate in that, please put your name on the sign-up list. And then we've got, I think there are five or six men that have signed up for the chili, uh, we call it the chili cook-off. But uh, uh, the only thing I ask is that you be like Brother Mike. If you're going to make it real hot, put hot on there, and I'll make sure I avoid yours. Because I don't eat the hot stuff. My brother, brother Charlie told me the same thing. They don't eat the hot stuff either, so... But there are a lot of folks in our church that do. There are folks in our church that love it. Now, at one time, Brother Charlie used to like that real hot stuff. He told me that, but he kind of got out of that now. So, uh, But you're welcome to do that. Make it hot. Make it mild. I don't care. Just just come fellowship with us. We'll have some sandwiches, and uh, we'll have some refreshments. Ladies, or we're trying to coordinate with the ladies. Just We don't need a lot of sandwiches, but the ladies try to bring some sandwiches, a few of them. So we'll have sandwiches to go with the chili, and then uh, uh, probably a dessert or two, if somebody can bring a dessert. Uh, a couple of ladies bring a dessert. That would be great. We just have a good fellowship right here at the church in the fellowship hall. That's at 530 this coming Saturday at 530. So please be here. Bring somebody with you. Even if you're not going to participate in making a pot of chili or, or, or even if you're one of the ladies and just you just can't make it for the gingerbread construction, make sure you come for the fellowship that night. We don't care whether you bring anything or not. That's not a big deal. But we want you to come that night and fellowship and enjoy the fellowship. Um, I, I don't think I stressed that as much last Sunday. Sunday. want everybody to come and just have a good time of fellowship. This is a church fellowship. We want you to come. You're part of the church. We want you to come. So remember that this coming Saturday. Missionary of the Week, Brother Antonio and Sister Sharon Nur. Let's continue to pray for them as they work with the Asians in ministry. The Lord might bless them and help them and use them. I was reading some information from a missionary. We don't support this missionary. He was a good brother and reading some information this week. God's really using them. Uh, it's on a foreign field, and God's using them in a great way. But I'm telling you, they're going through some difficult times right now. Uh, we don't ever forget you missionaries. Out of all the Christians that we know, missionaries are probably on the front lines. Comparatively with everybody else, missionaries are on the front lines, and we want to pray for them. The Lord might use them in a mighty way. And it doesn't matter whether they're home mission work or foreign mission work. The devil targets them because they're right on the front lines trying to present the gospel, trying to see someone saved for the grace, by the grace of God. We want to pray for them. The Lord might continue to use them and help them and be a blessing to them. Uh, we, will, we, we had postponed our, our missions conference, and I'm probably going to go ahead and announce it next couple of weeks when we're going to have that. Uh, we were just not able to get it into the 12 months of this year. It'll be early next year before we get really busy in the spring, so I'll give you the date. I've got to finalize the date. We had finalized dates once, and then we had to pull out and change dates and everything going on, and uh, did not get that redone, but we'll get that for you. And when we do that, uh, we want, we'll have either a one-day or a three-day missions conference, and uh, we want to reevaluate our missions giving, where, where we're at, make sure individually, personally, make sure we're doing exactly what the Lord wants and see what the Lord has us and go from there, okay? So uh, I'll mention that to you probably next couple of weeks we'll get that, uh, get that to you. Got a, lot, got a lot going on next month or so. We got, well, a little over a month. We've got Christmas coming up. Then you've got New Year's, New Year's Day coming up after that. There'll be special Christmas, Christmas revivals that'll be going on. There, I know there'll be watch night services going on, that kind of thing. This year's a little bit unusual, so let me kind of give you the schedule on this year. Uh, much like what we did with, with, with um, some of the other holidays we have, when the, when the holiday falls on Sunday, which Christmas and New Year's Day falls on Sunday this year, we will have Sunday morning services. We will not have Sunday night services. So keep that in mind. Um, we'll have Sunday morning services on Christmas, and we won't have Sunday night. Christmas falls on Sunday. We won't have Sunday night. We'll let you have some time with your family. And then New Year's Day, we'll also do the same thing. We'll have New Year's Day services uh, here on that Sunday morning, uh, but we won't have Sunday evening services. So that's the schedule uh, for right now. Uh, I've been, been invited, as I am every year, to go to a lot of watch night services. I don't think I'm going to get to go this year. I mean, they pray in the new year. You're still there at midnight, a little bit after midnight. You get home somewhere around 1 o'clock, depending on how far you drive. You get home 1 o'clock in the morning and then have to preach the next morning and handle the service. It's a little bit difficult on you. So I probably won't get to go to any watch night services uh, this year, but you're welcome to do so, and I don't want to hold any of you back. I, I know, uh, I think it was last year, um, Brother Leonard and Miss Linda went with us over to uh, – Martin's Grove Independent Baptist Church, they had a watch night service, I think it's last year. But uh, you're welcome to go, but I probably won't get to go this year. But that's your schedule. We'll get it put in the bulletin next week so that you're reminded of that. All right, Brother Jim is going to come lead us in our last song. Glory to his name. And that's found on page 188. 188 as we stand together. 
Down at the cross where my Savior died Down where for cleansing from sin I cried There to my heart was the blood applied Glory to His name Glory to His name Glory to His name There to my heart was the blood applied Glory to His name I am so wondrously saved from sin Jesus so sweetly abides within There at the cross where He took me in Glory to His name Glory to His name Glory to His name there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. O oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name There to my heart was the blood applied Glory to His name Come to this fountain so rich and sweet Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet Plunge in today and be made complete Glory to His name Glory to His name, glory to His name, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to His Amen. Thank you, Sister Linda. Thank you, Brother Jim, for the good music. Thank you, thank you for um, your faithfulness in, in serving the Lord and being a part of our service. I was glad to have Brother Jim back. I'm thankful that the Lord had touched him and Miss Linda, both of them, and uh, Miss Linda Gilliland, able to have them back in church, miss them when they're out. And uh, even while they're out, they're still doing things constantly. There are things I've just found out that had been done that I was thinking I was going to have to do that Brother Jim had, had already handled. And um, I'm, I'm, I thank, I'm thankful the Lord has him around about the house, Lord. And thank you for, all for being here this morning. I'm glad the Lord touched you and helped you with your health. And uh, Sister Minish as well. She's struggled a lot with migraines here lately. I'm glad the Lord touched her and helped her to be here. And then others, uh, Sister Jean and Brother John, just many of them that the Lord has helped to be here today. Thank you for being in your, in your place. Uh, the book of Psalms, chapter 34, if you would. Book of Psalms, chapter 34, and Proverbs, chapter 1. God put this message on my heart over a week ago, and I'm going to try to preach it. Probably going to have to be preaching two two sessions. Uh, I don't. Uh, there's no way I can get it in one in one message. And I'm going to preach the first part today. I don't know. I, I might come back tonight and preach the second part, and then again, I may just wait. Um, but the first part is really the introduction, the heart of the message. I want to preach today on the fear of losing the fear of the Lord, the fear of losing the fear of the Lord. The Bible said much. It says much about the fear of the Lord and the fear of God. Uh, the fear of the Lord is in our worship. Psalms chapter 5, verse number 7. I won't read these verses. Give them to you in reference if you want them. But the fear of the Lord is in our worship. The fear of the Lord is in clean living. Psalm 19, 9. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Twice it says that uh, in the Bible. In Proverbs chapter 9, verse number 10, it says it. The fear of the Lord is in the duty of man. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. You read much about the fear of the Lord. By the fear of God. And it's clear from Genesis all the way through Revelation, God is to be feared in a reverential fear. God is God. God is a spirit. We need to worship Him in spirit and truth. But God is holy. God is righteous. And we need to respect that and revere that. 
But the fear of the Lord is mentioned much in the Bible. There's two ways that fear is described in the Bible. And one way fear is described as uh, unbelieving and sinful. When we fear mankind or we fear situations as a child of God, that is an act of unbelief. That is sinful. We're not to do that. But the other way that it's described in the Bible, the other meaning is an evidence of an honest walk with God, the fear of the Lord. One description describes the heart of the disobedient, the other the heart of the obedient. And the fear of the Lord, you'll find out in the Bible, is the door that opens up God's favor and blessings in our life. We are to fear the Lord. We are to fear God. That's the verses that I'm going to be dealing with this morning pertaining to the fear of God. I think in our day and age, we have a famine. Pertaining to the fear of God. We, we are, you're seeing it as bad now as I've ever seen it. Now, I've only been on this earth 57 years, be 58 in February. But as far as I've ever seen it, this is as bad as we've ever, ever seen it. This is the most blasphemous age I've ever seen. People are flying in the face of God today regularly. And they're trying to force that upon you and I. We are lacking in the fear of the Lord today. We're lacking the presence of God uh, in people's individual lives in that they show respect and fear towards God. We don't see that nowadays. We're missing that. That's what I want to preach on this morning. Psalm chapter 34, verse number 7, we'll begin our reading. For without cause, I'm sorry, wrong, wrong verse. Verse, uh, seven, verse 7 of chapter 34. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. Now, the word fear is three times mentioned in these three verses. Verse number seven, it says, fear him. It's talking about the Lord. Verse number nine says, fear the Lord. And then again, verse number nine, it says, fear him. So it's clear here in Psalm chapter 34 a psalm of David, we are to fear God, we are to fear the Lord, and there, that is the basis of many of the blessings that God gives us. Now look at Proverbs chapter 1, if you would. Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 7. And then we're going to look at Proverbs 2, just across the page. Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now you want to pay attention to that, we're going to come back to it in a minute. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Chapter 2, verse number 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up the vo thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures... Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. You can't know God unless you know some things about God. That's what verse number 5 is talking about. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. You can't know God until you know something about God. And there's some things we need to know about God. There is but one God, Isaiah 46, 9. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. There's also but one Savior, Isaiah 43, 11. I, even I, am the Lord and beside me there is no Savior. There is one mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. These things you've got to know in order to know God. If you don't know that there's one God, you can't know God. If you accept all gods of the world as equal, you can't know God. You've got to understand there's just but one God. You've also got to understand that one God is the Savior of the world. You've got to recognize that or he won't save you. So you've got to understand there's one God. You've got to understand there's one Savior. You've got to understand there's one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus, he's our, our refuge. He's the way we can get to God and get to heaven. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. These things you've got to know in order to know God. Before you can find knowledge, verse 5, Proverbs chapter 2 says, before you can find knowledge and the knowledge of God, you've got to possess the fear of God. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Before you can understand the, the most rudimentary, the most basic things about God, the knowledge of God, you've got to have a certain fear of God, a certain reverence towards God. 
The fear of the Lord is the very heart of faith in God. Without the fear of the Lord, you can never properly know God. And if you lose the fear of the Lord, you can never properly serve God. That's where we find ourselves in the modern society and in the modern church. We have a situation today that for the first time in, in a, a, number of, a number of generations, we have a modern church that's trying to operate outside of the fear of the Lord. The modern church expounds and expresses the love of God, the grace of God, but they don't ever want to look at the other side of things. The judgment of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God. They don't ever want to examine that. We're living in a day and age where when I say church, I'm talking about the church at large. I'm not talking about us necessarily or other fundamental Bible-believing churches. I'm talking about the, the church at large. The church had to end up eventually being that Babylonian church during the tribulation. The church at large does not acknowledge the fear of the Lord. In fact, matter, there are people out there today, that, I'm telling you, there are people being pulled pits today that will be preaching that a Christian is not to fear the Lord. That's only for the lost. But that's contrary to Scripture. The Bible doesn't hold that up. The indictment of the world in the last days is that they have a knowledge of the truth but do not possess genuine salvation. And the reason behind that is they do not possess the fear of the Lord. They do not represent the fear of the Lord. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 if you would. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The fear of the Lord is a very heart of faith, and without the fear of the Lord, you're not going to honor God. Without the fear of the Lord, you're not going to have the knowledge of God. And without the fear of the Lord, you're not going to maintain the right relationship with Christ. As, as, a, as a Christian, you can't. And that's how the world is indicted in the last days. This passage deals with the last days, uh, the last times, and we're going to look at that. 2 Timothy, chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. This also know that in the last days perilous times Shall come. So we're talking about it in the last days. Verse 2 For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Verse 4 Traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. I think we can all agree that describes our day to, to a T. Verse 5 having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So uh, he's describing in the last days, and the religious people in that last day, and I said religious, not saved, but the religious people in the last days will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the power thereof. In the last days, many will join with organized religion, some form of organized religion, but they will not be a part of real salvation. If you've been saved by the grace of God, you know something about the power of God. It was the power of God that saved you. And only through the power of God are you redeemed. Only through the power of God. These people that are being described here do not have the power. They deny the power. They're not born again. They're religious in the last days. But they're not born again. They're not genuinely saved. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts. It's not by mistake that verse 6 talks about the silly women. Look at the religious crowd of our day being driven by silly women. I'm not attacking women. I'm not attacking women at all. I'm talking about some of the silliness being pushed by so-called women, female preachers of the gospel and women uh, apostles and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's something we've only seen during, really during the last century. Something that's come about during the last century, the massive push by the, by the emotional crowd, the emotional crowd in the last days in the church. Now, this is the crowd that denies the fear of the Lord. This is the crowd that says the fear of God is not intended for the Christian. The Christian is only supposed to be about good things and, and great things and bright things. The fear of the Lord is only for the lost person. That stands in contradiction to the Word of God. We'll get in that in just a minute. I want you to see this. I want you to see why the world is in the condition that it's in. I want you to see why there's so many people in our day that are religious, but that seems that many of them are lost. They fit the description in verse number 5, having a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Look at verse number 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They understand the gospel intellectually. But they are not allowed to be saved. Now, I use that word intentionally. 
The word able there literally means not capable or not possible. Not capable or not possible. They are ever learning. They have an intellectual knowledge of the gospel, but they are never able. They are never possible or never capable to come to the knowledge of the truth. They are not allowed to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why are they not allowed to be saved? Why are they not allowed to come to the knowledge of the truth? They're not capable of being saved. What is preventing them from being saved? Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse number 12. Romans chapter 3, verse number 12. This is the final verdict or indictment upon this world. We are all guilty before God. Many of these verses you could quote. I want, you to, show, I want to show you something this morning. There's something that stands out to me in these passages here. Romans chapter 3, verse number 12. There's some reason, according to the scripture we just read, there's some reason... Why these people in the last days, which I firmly believe we're living in, these people that are religious, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They've never received that power to be saved. And so they're ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They're never able to fully be born again, to, to trust God and be saved by the grace of God. There's something that's making it incapable. It's not making it possible. What is it? Verse number 12, Romans chapter 3. They're all gone out of the way. They're to, all to, uh, they together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. This is not talking about saved people. This is an indictment of the world. Their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues. They have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their way. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, that saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 19 and 20 is what I want to look at. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So it's important uh, in, in, as far as salvation is concerned that you become guilty before God. Verse 20, therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. You can't be saved by works, never could be. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. What these two verses are saying is you can't be saved until you become guilty and you can't become guilty until you understand the knowledge of sin. That's, you put them together, that's what they're saying. You can't be saved until you become guilty, and you can't become guilty until you understand the knowledge of sin, have something, some kind of knowledge of sin. That's why the Bible's important, to teach us this knowledge and show us that we're sinners. According to Proverbs chapter 2 and verse number 5, however, you cannot find the knowledge of God until you possess the fear of God. You can't find the knowledge. That's what we read. That's what we read just a little while ago. You can't find the knowledge of God until you possess the fear of God. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So you can't find the knowledge of God, which is the knowledge of sin in the Bible. You can't understand it without the fear of God. He's describing lost people in Romans chapter 3. Look at verse number 18. That's the indictment. This is the cause. This is why 2 Timothy talked about over there in 2 Timothy that they're not capable of being saved. This is why, verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. See, it all fits like a puzzle. Before you can get saved, you've got to get guilty. Before you can become guilty, you've got to have the knowledge of sin. And unless there's a fear of God as the foundation you can't understand the knowledge of sin. You can't receive the knowledge of sin. The knowledge of God won't come to you if there is no fear of God. And this is the problem with our day. We've got people, we've got churches that have lost the fear of God. And because they've lost the fear of God, they've lost the power of God. We've got Christians that have lost the fear of God. And because they've lost the fear of God, they've lost the power of God. We don't have the influence to this world that we once held because at one time we feared God. And they recognized a change in our life because we feared God with a holy fear and they desired that change. They'd see something different. 
The average Christian today doesn't look far much different than the average sinner. It's lost without God. Not a whole lot of difference. Not a whole lot. There used to be a time where sinners that were not living for God, whether they professed to be saved or not, if they were not living, living for God, if they were not doing right, if they were living in sin, they feared walking through those doors back there. They feared coming to the house of God. One of the clear ways a pastor could tell if a, sinner was, if a church member was starting to back up on God, maybe starting to dabble in sin, one of the first ways he could recognize that, he just stopped coming to the house of God. She just stopped coming. They're dabbling in sin. I'm not talking about they, they falter or they fail and they get it right. I'm talking about they're starting to wallow in something. You clearly see it. They just start laying out. It just wasn't coming. They, they feared the house of God. There was a time, beloved, when sinners would come down the middle aisle trembling under conviction and come to Christ. There was a time when, when sinners would come down the old dusty trail, old tent meeting, trembling under the conviction of God and come to Christ. When's the last time you saw any sinner tremble before God? We've lost the fear of God. We've lost it individually and corporately as a church. We don't have the fear of God as we once did. And because of that, we've lost power. There are souls out there where they're filling churches this morning. They're filling them up. They're lost. They don't know God. They don't know the power of God. God's never changed their life because they've never wanted it changed. They don't understand God in this simple truth. They don't, oh, they, intellectually, they get it. But they've never understood the power of God in their life because they've never let God change them. They're all across church pews. This is a crowd that if the rapture of the church happened tonight, this is the crowd that would make up that Babylonian church during the tribulation. They won't be lacking for members during the tribulation. There'll be many of them, many of them. And that's why they don't really miss the Christian when they're out of here. They'll make an excuse for it. They won't really miss it. They'll just keep on going in the church just like they did before. It's no different for them. If you're lacking the power of God, you're not missing anything during the tribulation. There's no power before it and there's no power after it, the rapture of the church, if you're lacking the power of God. We have lost the fear of God in our day and it's an indictment upon me as a Christian, me as a pastor, and us as a church. It's an indictment upon us. A lost sinner does not know God, walk through those doors and sit on these pews, they ought to immediately, before a first word is spoken, they ought to immediately be under the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. Immediately. If we have a proper fear of God and our walk with Christ is what it ought to be, they will. It may not get saved. They may fight it off. But they should immediately be under the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. We have folks this morning that are walking in churches today, and they're sitting in church right now, and boy, the rock band's up there playing, and they're waving their arms, and they're up there, and they're living shacked up with some woman in sin. They just, they're trying to come down off the drug high they were on that weekend, and when they get home, they're going to pop open a beer, get drunk. They don't think one thing about being in the house of God. There's no fear of God. There's no fear of God from the sinner, because there's no fear of God from the saint. We've lost the fear of God. And that's the key. That's the key. What he's explaining there, verse number 18, there's no fear of God before their eyes. And since there's no fear of God, they cannot understand the knowledge of sin. And since they can't understand the knowledge of sin, they can never become guilty before God. How do I know many of these folks that are religious aren't saved? They never became guilty. They weren't guilty of anything. They just felt like they needed to make sure they get that ticket out of hell. But they never became guilty. They were never under conviction as far as, as what we would describe as Bible conviction. The treasure of salvation is in the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 33, verse number 5. The Lord is exalted, for he dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. And strength of salvation, the fear of the Lord, is his treasure. And strength of salvation, the fear of the Lord, is his treasure. The treasure of salvation is the fear of the Lord. Beloved, without the fear of the Lord, you're not going to get saved. We got people that have accepted Jesus in our day as their buddy, as their pal. I was in a service. I was in service once. And this wasn't too long ago. This was in the last five years. I was in a service, and the fellow that claimed to be the preacher... He addressed him as his buddy. He's a close bud of mine. 
I'm going to tell you something. Jesus is the dearest friend I've ever had. But he's not my buddy. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. I owe him everything. I understand that the God that died on that cross and shed his blood for me, he gave me his love because he loved me so much. He gave me that righteousness and made me righteous, not because I deserved it. I deserved hell. But he gave it to me because he loved me that much. But he himself is a holy and a righteous God without sin. He should have never had anything to do with me because I was a lost, wicked sinner. But he loved me enough to give me his righteousness, and he, he took my sins and nailed them to the cross of Calvary. Now, that's a gift of God. I love him because he's my Savior. I love him because he's my Lord. He is the dearest friend I ever had. But I would never address him as my buddy or my pal. He's my Lord. He's God incarnate. But that's the world we're living in. There's no fear of God. The very foundation of our salvation is in the fear of the Lord. Our society has lost the fear of God. There was a time when we would describe a devoted Christian as a God-fearing man or a God-fearing woman, but no longer. You don't hear that phrase used anymore. People don't identify anybody that way anymore, not in our society. There was also a time when we would see people literally, as I've already mentioned, literally. They would tremble under conviction. They would grab the back of the pews until their knuckles turned white under Holy Ghost conviction. There was such fear of God because they know they were turning against a holy and a righteous God. There was a time when the messages that were preached from the pulpit had titles like sinners in the hands of an angry God. You know what they entitle them now? My BFF Jesus. It's the day we're living in. It's the last days. It's the last days, just like 2 Timothy says. They have a form of godliness. They deny the power thereof. They're not capable of coming to the full knowledge of the truth, being saved. They're not capable, not because God failed, but because they have no fear of God. They do not recognize who God is and what God is providing. They have no fear of God. That's not the basis of their foundation. They don't recognize what salvation is all about. They don't understand it. We're living in a day where there's a famine of the fear of God, and the reason the fear of God is lacking in society is because it's lacking in the church. Now, back if you go back now, even in the 70s, and I was just a child then, but late 70s, I was saved mid-70s, late 70s, I began to pay attention to a whole lot of things and got in the independent Baptist movement more in the late 70s, 79 or so, 80. I began to see a lot even then. But if you go back in those days, you'll recognize there was a lot of turmoil in America. There's a lot of turmoil in the world, even back then. I mean, you had all the, the marches, you had all the, you had the shootings at colleges and by, by the National Guard, and you, you had all the marches and the, you know, the bonfires and all the rebellion. You had all that out in the world. But one thing you had in the church was a fear of God. You still had the fear of God. People feared the Lord. People were still coming trembling. My daddy got saved. My daddy was saved in 79, I think it was. Might have been, no, I'm sorry, it was 80. And uh, my dad came to the Lord in 1980, and uh, he came trembling. He came from the back pew of the church. First time he'd been in church in decades, probably. And uh, before then, it was just for a funeral or something. Come out squalling and crying and trembling, coming down the aisle, hollering out, somebody's got to show me how to be saved. I've got to be saved. I saw that. I was in the service. I saw that. I saw other men. I, I, saw, I saw a chief petty officer under great conviction, literally trembling, as he knelt at an altar and trusted Christ as his Savior. I saw that. I saw it. It's been a long time since I saw anything like that. Is God at fault? No, sir. No, sir. God's the same God. Conviction is the same conviction. The Holy Ghost is the same Holy Ghost. The problem is we grieve God because we've lost the fear. We don't reverence the house of God as we once did. We don't reverence God as we once did. We begin, I think, listening to this world's approach towards God, this, this wicked world's approach towards God that he, maybe he can be a buddy. Maybe he can be a pal. Maybe he's not as, as hard-lined as some people say. No, you better understand God's a righteous God. God's a holy God, and God demands holiness. He knows we can't do it in our flesh, so he sent his son to die for us so that we can do it through Christ. But you need to understand God is to be reverenced. There is to be a certain fear of the Lord. And I'm not talking about just an awe of his majesty. Oh, yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd have awe in his majesty, certainly. 
But there needs to be a certain tenet about us that has a fear, a holy fear of God. I don't fear God like I fear man. I'm not talking about that. Let me give you this example. My dad, my dad was a disciplined man in his own way. Dad was a disciplined man. He had an alcohol problem. He was a disciplined man. He, he went to World War II when he was 15. He lied about his age. He fought South Pacific. When he finished his tour and the war was over, he rejoined as part of the Army Air Corps. He was a drill sergeant. And uh, my dad, I've told you before, my dad, there were three of us boys at home at the time, two sisters, three boys, but my dad made sure he drilled into those three boys some discipline. My dad was a disciplined man. I love my dad. I still, my dad's in heaven now. I still love him. I loved my dad. I loved my dad. I don't know if I had anybody closer in the world than my mom and my dad as, as, as an adolescent. I didn't have a friend closer than I had a great respect for my dad. And, and I, I appreciated my dad, the, the things he knew, the experiences he had enjoyed, the discipline he held. I respected that. But let me tell you something. I also feared my dad. I feared him in the right way. I understood that he was more powerful than I was. I understood that he was bigger than I was. I understood he had more experience than I did. I didn't just respect him as far as his all in his, in his person. I feared my dad as my dad, as every child should. I feared him as my dad. I did not want to see the wrath of my dad. I didn't want to dis disobey him. I didn't want to displease him. I didn't want to disappoint him either. There was a certain fear involved with my dad. And you may have had the same thing with your dad. That's the kind of respect that we owe God. He's our Heavenly Father. We're His children. We have an awe of His majesty. We have a, a respect of God in His person. But as His child, there should be a certain fear involved as well. We should fear disappointing Him. We should fear disobeying Him, not because He's going to destroy us. We're His child. I never thought my dad was going to kill me, literally kill me, if I disobeyed Him. I didn't want to disobey Him. I didn't want to see His wrath, but I didn't want to disobey Him and disappoint Him to begin with. I did have a certain fear, and I have a fear of my God. As a child of God, I have a fear of my God. I would have never walked into my dad, disrespected him by saying, this is my bud, this is my BFF. No, he is my dad. I respected him as such. He was over me, rightly so. God's my God. He's my Lord. He's over me, rightly so. I should have an awe and a respect of him, but there should be a fear and the fact of who he is. He's holy. He's righteous. He's perfect in judgment. He's God. There needs to be a fear of God. We've lost it. We've lost our fear of God. Because we've lost our fear of God, we're not presenting the full knowledge of the truth. Because we're not presenting the full knowledge of the truth, we grieve the moving of the Holy Ghost. Sinners are getting religious, but they're not getting saved. Many of them are not. Our society has lost the fear of God. Our churches have lost the fear of God. And we're living in a day where there's a famine in the area of the fear of God. And there are even some folks out there, I'm telling you, there are some folks out there that in modern Christianity who claim that only the lost need to fear God. And that's not Bible. That's not textual. Uh, the passage we read in Psalm chapter 34 and in, in verse number 9, that's, that verse we, we read, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. That's not talking to the lost. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. Over in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. My beloved, he opens up that, that verse there with my beloved. Wherefore, my beloved, these are the saints. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. They've already been born again or they wouldn't be beloved. So he's not talking about being saved. He's talking about live your life. Let your salvation be expressed to the world. Work out. Let the salvation work through you. God saved you. That's the beginning point. Now let God's grace and salvation work through you through the power of the Holy Ghost so that the rest of the world can see your testimony. But do it with fear and trembling towards God. Fear God. Fear God. It doesn't stop when you get saved. It should increase when you get saved. It should focus on the fear of God when you get saved. Who he is, his personage. 
Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 17. The Bible said, if you call on the Father, okay, so if he's the Father, he's your Father, who without respect to persons judgeth according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning here in fear. Talking to the brethren. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, he's talking to the brethren as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot, past the time of your sojourning here in fear. That's a reverential fear of God. That's not just holding him in awe and his majesty. That's a reverential fear of God. There should be a fear in our hearts as a child of God of disappointing him, letting him down, failing him, willfully turning from the path of righteousness and turning to the path of selfishness. Willfully saying, I'm going to do this sin and I know it's wrong and I know it disobeys God. But me and God, we tight. We're close. He'll understand. No, he doesn't understand. He's a righteous and a holy God. He sent his son to die for you, to, to cleanse you of all your sins. He doesn't, ex he doesn't understand you just yielding to it just because you want to do it. He's given you the power not to do that. Does he forgive you when we do this? Yes, he will. If you go with a contrite heart, your spirit's right. You go with a broken heart, contrite spirit, yeah, God will forgive you. If you confess it and repent, God will forgive you. But he's not pleased with you doing that. We need to have a certain fear of God. The passage in 1 Peter 1, 17 is directed to believers. It's to believers. The verse is speaking to the child of God. And as a child of God, I am commanded to fear the Lord. And that doesn't mean just give him respect or hold him in awe. I am to give him respect. I am to hold him in awe. But I'm to fear the Lord. I'm to reverence God. And I'm to have a holy fear of him. We've lost the fear of God in our day. Uh, brethren, we need to fervently pray that God would awaken the fear of God in our hearts. I'm telling you, without the fear of God, the Christian is powerless. The Christian is fruitless because we're living in a sin-cursed society. Without the proper fear of God, we are powerless. And that's why we're not seeing souls saved like we used to see. God didn't fail. God hasn't failed. We've got preachers that are, in essence, blaming it on God. Well, we're just living in a different age. I know we're living in a different age. Let me tell you something. God's salvation has been available since, since Christ died on the cross of Calvary. His salvation through the blood has been available. Has been available. God's been saving folks for a long time. Through, all, through the dark ages and through everything else. God was no less God in the dark ages than he is today or than he was in the days of revival. God's still God. His salvation is still real. And he'll still save anybody that bows a humble heart and calls upon him in faith. He'll do that. It's not God's fault that folks aren't getting saved. No. It falls on the church. We've lost the fear of God. We've lost the fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the success of the church. I've got to close. But look at Acts chapter 9. The book of Acts, chapter 9, verse number 31. This is in the early church. God is blessing them. God had just redeemed the, um, the old wicked man named Saul, who later becomes Paul. He was a wicked, violent Pharisee. His name was Saul. God had just redeemed him, saved him early in chapter 9. And the Bible gives us a, a, a summary of the early New Testament church. Acts, chapter 9, verse number 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea, because they, they'd been being persecuted all up this point in time. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. The presence of God gives us comfort from worldly fears and causes us to walk in only the fear of the Lord. That's the proper positioning. These folks, the early church, were under great persecution. They had a lot to be afraid of the world for. There was a lot to be afraid of the world. They were dying at the hand of, the, of these um, Judaizers. They were dying. They were dying. They were dying at the hand of the worldly Gentiles. They were dying. This is that period of time. They were dying. They had reason to be fearful. They were being tortured. They had reason to be fearful. In the midst of all that, 
The Bible said they were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. The Holy Ghost were, was comforting them from the worldly fears and yet was putting in their heart the cause to walk in only the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to replace all of their fears. And when you truly walk in the fear of the Lord, you won't be afraid of anything else. He helps you. The Holy Ghost comforts you in those moments at that time. A church cannot grow unless they walk in a genuine fear of God, and neither can a Christian. You can't. The modern church has lost the fear of God. Because of that, the modern church has very little power of God. And the same can be said of the modern Christian. Many professing Christians today are living powerless lives. You know that's true. You know it is. They're living one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And the reason they're doing that, they lost the fear of God. If they had the fear of God in their heart as, as it was when God saved them, if they had the fear of God in their heart as they, as, they, as they should biblically, they wouldn't be able to walk one foot in the world and one foot in the church. We do that because we've lost the fear of God. We give him the temptation, we give him the lust, we give him to every, uh, everything that comes our way, and then when a trial comes our way, we give up. That's an indictment upon our world, beloved. Instead of being dedicated soldiers of God, many times we end up being nothing more than lifeless plastic figurines. No more power to fight against the wiles of the devil than an army of fake tin soldiers. And that's sometimes the way we Christians are, me included. I've been saved over 45 years now. I was thinking about it yesterday. I've been saved over 45 years now. And I've got to admit, there have been times in my Christian life when I've examined myself in the mirror of God's Word. And I've come to the shocking conclusion that that lively soldier of the cross of Calvary that once consumed me, it consumed my life, that lively on fire soldier for God that once consumed me had at times reverted back to being nothing more than just plastic figurine I looked like a soldier and I could act like a soldier but in my heart it wasn't a soldier's heart the fire that one time had burned brightly in my soul had diminished and I found myself just grandstanding before my spiritual peers I got to make myself look good and and many a Christian could say that in our life sometime in our life where we would just been going with the flow but in our heart we were cold and indifferent, apathetic, and even dabbling in sin. Why? Because we lost the fear of the Lord. We lost it. Pretending to be vibrant soldiers of the cross, but in reality we're cold and apathetic and uninvolved. Oh, we still wear our Christian uniform. for well, people to recognize us. We're Christian. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. But we don't know the power of God in our life at that time because we lost the fear of the Lord. We need the fear of God. We need it back. I'm telling you, beloved, we need it back. Every time and I found myself in those conditions, now I'm telling you that over the 45 years, every time when I found myself in the condition that I just described to you, I found that the cause of my condition was always the same. Every single time I can, I can, I can reduce it down to one thing. I let the fear of God slip in my life. It used to be where I did not want to disappoint God. It used to be I didn't want to disobey God. Not that I thought he was going to consume me with his fire he could have. But he loved me and I loved him. And I didn't think he was going to consume me with his fire. But I didn't want to disappoint him because I loved him. I feared him with a holy fear. I respected God and his holiness, his righteousness. I didn't want to disobey him. I didn't want to disappoint him. I didn't want to let him down. But when I began to get cold, I began to let the fear of the Lord slip. It didn't bother me as much to disappoint him. It didn't bother me as much to disobey him. And the further you get from God, the less and less it's going to bother you. Because the less and less the fear of the Lord in your heart resides. It diminishes and goes down and goes down and goes down. My symptoms were apathy, indifference, worldliness, and sin. But they were only symptoms. They were not the cause. The cause of my spiritual condition was that I had lost the fear of the Lord. And because I lost the fear of God in my heart, my Christian life had become sterile. Let me read this last verse. Proverbs chapter 19, verse number 23. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life. And he that hath it shall abide 
satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. The basis of our Christian life has got to be the fear of the Lord. Not only to a lost and dying world that they might see Jesus, but so that we might have life fulfilled. I'm going to tell you, beloved, it's easy to do. It's easy to let it slip. I'm telling you it is. You rub shoulders with the world. You listen to the worldly newscast and you get involved in all the things the world has to offer constantly. I mean, you can't turn on a TV without being tempted with lust. Every commercial, every sitcom, even the news now. I saw somebody sent me th something the other day, some female broadcaster on the news and how she's dressed. I'm going, I can't believe this. You can't even turn on the news without lust and tempting, temptations coming your way. You can't walk through a store without revealing advertising thrown, being thrown in your face. You can't listen to anything on the radio without being tempted in your flesh. It's there. And all the while this world is saying, you don't owe God any respect. You don't owe God any respect. And it beats on you and beats on you and beats on you. If you're not careful, you'll slowly, without recognizing it, you'll slowly let the fear of the Lord in your life diminish and diminish and diminish. And that's what's happened to the church. We've let it slip. And then we started compromising with the world. Old Vance Havner, made, and I'm paraphrasing for him, but Vance Havner said years and years ago, I think back to the 60s, he said the devil's not putting his front line, all his best army at our front door, ready to fight us when we leave the church house. He's abandoned that aspect of it. He just brought some people dressed in suits and sat them right there amongst us. He's planted the tares right in the midst. And, he's, and he was right. That's the indictment of the church, I'm telling you. In our day, we're powerless, or at least lacking in power, because we've lost the fear of the Lord. We let it slip. We need it back. And there's only one way to get it back. Confess, repent, and ask God for it. We need God to move in our midst. It's a work of the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you. That's a work of the Holy Ghost. You can't work it up. The arm of the flesh cannot work up the fear of the Lord in your life. It never will. That's a work of the Holy Ghost. That's a spiritual work, and God's got to do it. So me as an individual, me as a pastor, and you as the church, we've got to ask God. We've got to seek his face. If we want the power of God back, we've got to get back to fearing the Lord. That holy and reverential fear. When we walk into the house of God, the fear of the Lord should be, should be so real, so, so strong, that we're so sensitive not to grieve him in the house of God. Whatever he wants, we're going to do it because we don't want to disappoint him. We fear him that much. In a holy, reverential fear as a child would his father. We need it back. We really do. Would you stand to your feet? I ask Sister Minnie to come to the piano. There are several ways that we are to respect the fear of the Lord. And there are several reasons behind all that. The success of the church is in the fear of the Lord. Uh, the fear of the Lord is clearly the success of the church. The fear of the Lord is the secret of God's favor. The fear of the Lord is the source of life. The fear of the Lord is the strength of praise. I don't know when I'll get to finish the message. I don't know if I'll finish it tonight. I might. But the, Lord's, the fear of the Lord is all those things. In the life of the Christian, the fear of the Lord is all those things. We need to get back to fear of God. We need God to help us to do that. While she plays, if the Lord spoke to your heart, mind him this morning. Be obedient to him. Let him help you. You come if you need to come today. The fear of the Lord. I just have to wonder, I have to wonder like you do, if the fear of God was as strong today as it had been in days gone by at times. I, I, I don't know for sure, but I've got some loved ones I like to sit under that fear, that type of trembling under the hand of God. I think they'd have a good chance of getting saved if they did. I pray still for the fear of God to come upon a congregation of people, me, that loved ones might come to conviction. We need that, church. I think that's the thing that's blocking them in our day. In the last days, perilous times shall come. I think that's what's blocking those folks in that day. They just, they don't understand God. And since they don't understand God, they can't get saved. They don't have to have the doctrines of God. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about in their heart, in their heart, 
They don't recognize the holiness and righteousness of God. They don't recognize their own guilt before a holy and a righteous God. They don't see themselves as being guilty. It's just something they do. You can't get saved until you get guilty. You can't get guilty until you understand the knowledge of sin. And you can't understand the knowledge of sin without the fear of God. Some have come. Do you mind, mind the Lord this morning? Do you need to come? Mind the Lord. Let Him help you. Brother Mike, dismiss us in word of prayer, please.